made some surprising choices in my life, but perhaps none was more surprising to my friends and family than my choice of career upon graduation. I decided that I was gonna go into college ministry on a secular campus. A lot of my friends and family were surprised by that because they're like, college ministry, can you possibly make any money in that? And the answer is no, I couldn't really. And in fact, even many of my friends that I made in seminary were surprised that that was the route that I took. After learning that I received a religious studies degree at a state school and then decided to go into campus ministry, many of them were like, oh, wow. That, should, that must have been so hard. That must have been so difficult. Did you, did you ever see any fruit there? The answer is, yeah, I did. In fact, I look back at my time as a student and then as a college minister as some of the most fruitful spiritual seasons of my entire life. I found something that surprised many people, and that was the fact that the gospel was not only able to take root on these college campuses, but that it flourished, it grew, that people were responding to its message. And the reason I share that is because as we come to the end of this series, I want to talk about the surprising mission that we've been given. In Acts chapter 19, we actually learn three things about the mission of God, which are quite surprising. We learn first and foremost where the mission takes place, second, how we participate in it, and third, why it matters. So let's take a close look at Acts chapter 19 for a moment to first and foremost see where the mission of God takes place. This is what we read. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. See, what we find in Acts chapter 19 is a surprising place for the mission of the church to take root and flourish. It's the ancient city of Ephesus. You see, Ephesus was one of the greatest urban centers in the Roman world. It was host to the temple of Artemis, considered one of the great wonders of the ancient world, and it was diverse, cosmopolitan, and home to a variety of religions and philosophies. In a sense... Ephesus was the ancient version of modern-day New York City. See, we tend to think of the mission of the church as being to the far-flung places of the globe, to the very edges of civilization. But what we see in Acts chapter 19 is that the mission of the church, the mission of God, is actually found in the cities, at the center of culture, in the midst of the hustle and bustle of everyday life. In fact, Professor Harvey Cox in his book, The Secular City, said this, The rise of urban civilization is one of the hallmarks of our era. Urbanization constitutes a massive change in the way men live together as they have moved from tribe to town to technopolis. You see, in 1850, there were only four world-class cities of more than a million inhabitants. In 1980, there were 225 And by today's estimates, roughly 57% of the world's population now inhabit urban centers. We have been given a mission as God's people of making disciples of all nations. Well, where the nations currently gather and where the world views of the modern world are formed is in the cities at the very center of culture. But sadly, the church often looks at cities as a threat rather than as an opportunity. We tend to look at the center of culture with a great deal of suspicion, to to look to cities and these culture-making centers as threats to the mission and message of the church. In fact, James Davidson Hunter in his book, To Change the World, notes this kind of hostile posture that the church has increasingly begun to adopt, especially here in America. Here's what he writes. The tragedy of the modern American church is that in the name of resisting the internal deterioration of faith and the corruption of the world around them, many Christians, and Christian conservatives most significantly, unwittingly embrace some of the most corrosive aspects of the cultural disintegration they decry. By nurturing its resentments, sustaining them through a discourse of negation toward outsiders, and in cases pursuing their will to power, they participate in the very cultural breakdown they so ardently strive to resist. Rather than being defined by its cultural achievements, its intellectual and artistic vitality, its service to the needs of others, Christianity is defined to the outside world by its rhetoric of resentment, 
and the ambitions of a will in opposition to others. See, what he's noting is that the church tends to actually run from the centers of culture while still buying into the very worst parts of our cultural discourse. We run from the world, failing to see that we are called to be missionaries to the world. And that often in our attempts to preserve ourselves and protect ourselves and our way of life, we end up doing battle against the very communities and places that we are called to reach. But what we see as challenges, the Apostle Paul saw as opportunities. For the church in Ephesus actually became one of the major sending churches in the ancient world. Rather than struggling, the gospel actually flourished right there in the heart of the city. To such a degree that the Ephesian church became a major center of missionary movement out to the rest of the Roman world. You see, we are called as Christians to be in the world, but not of it. We're called to love the world without falling for it. So the question is how? How do we participate in that mission? Well, by bringing the light of the gospel to those who are spiritually seeking. One of the things that's really worth noting is how spiritually open many people are. One of the things that I find really surprising as I look at this story in Acts chapter 19 are the places that Paul goes to when he arrives in Ephesus. The first group of people that he encounters are people who'd been disciples of John the Baptist. They knew a little bit about this promise of the Messiah that John had spoken of, about the fact that a Savior was coming, but they didn't know who it was. And so Paul goes and speaks with them, and this is what he says. He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There are about 12 men in all. The first group that he went to was obviously the, spir the spiritually open and curious. These are probably some of the most easy people for us to, to identify when it comes to mission because they're already asking questions. They're already asking, they're already displaying an openness to God and, and even to Jesus Christ. And so Paul goes to them and tells them that this baptism that you were baptized into was always meant to point you to Christ. And they respond with great faith. But Paul doesn't stop there. We then read that he entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. He then went into the synagogues where the Jewish people were reading the scriptures. They were reading about the promises of God that he had made to their people down through the ages. And Paul walks in there and he says, these promises that you've been reading about in scripture are ultimately fulfilled in Christ. He is the one who has come as your promised Messiah, your promised anointed one. And while some of them rejected him, others followed him and put their trust in Jesus. Initially, it was a slightly harder to reach crowd, but that didn't deter Paul because he saw the spiritual hunger that was there. Finally, we read this. Paul then took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Paul went to a lecture hall. He went to a center of philosophy and continued to debate now not just with the Jewish people, but also those from the surrounding nations, those who were engaged in the various philosophies of the Roman world, the, the, the Greek intellectual elite. And what we read is that as Paul did this, the gospel spread greatly, not just in the city, but throughout the entire province of Asia Minor. Initially, this lecture hall, which would have been probably dedicated to pagan gods and that the Jewish people would have stand, stood at a distance from, Paul goes right there and says, it's here that the questions that your philosophies are asking find their answers in Jesus. You see, with John's disciples, with those in the synagogue and with those in the lecture hall, Paul really has one message, that all that they're looking for is ultimately found in Christ. But he went to the places where they themselves were seeking. 
He looked around and saw a city that was hungry for answers, that had deep spiritual longings. And rather than condemning them or holding them at arm's length, Paul entered into those places in ways that pointed them to Christ. I actually love how the noted British theologian and thinker John Stott talks about what our posture toward the wider world should be. Here's what he says in his book, The Contemporary Christian. People are looking for another, a transcendent reality. They seek it everywhere, through yoga, transcendental meditation, and Eastern religions, through sex, what Malcolm Muggeridge used to call the mysticism of the materialist, through music and the other arts, through a drug-induced higher consciousness, through modern cults, new age speculations, dangerous experiments with the occult, and the fantasies of science fiction. The immediate Christian reaction to these complex phenomenon should be one of sympathy, for we surely understand what is going on and why. See, what he notes is he says, look, when we look around at the wider world, we tend to look at it from a posture of judgment, to say, wow, look at all these lost people trying to pursue their fulfillment in things like sex and drugs and alcohol, who are looking to all these other bizarre religions and mysticism and totally losing their way. But John Stott says that shouldn't be our posture as Christians. Rather, our posture should be the exact same posture that Paul himself had. He looked around at all these things and he saw an opportunity. He saw beneath all the striving and the seeking a deep spiritual thirst and hunger. And he knew exactly the, the one who alone could satisfy the longings of people's hearts. He knew Jesus. And so he entered into those places in ways that, that helped them to understand the good news that Christ came to bring. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we have eyes to see and ears to hear the longings of people's hearts around us? Are we willing to open our ears to them rather than pounding our fists in judgment as we look at the world around us? You see, this is how we actually participate in the mission, by stepping in humbly and sympathetically, being willing to listen to the longings of the hearts of our neighbors around us and ask the question, how might we better point them to Christ? as the one who alone can satisfy the deepest longings of their hearts. And you see, this is why ultimately the gospel matters. It matters because it is good news for our modern world. There are actually three things that we see about the gospel as Paul presents it in, Eph in Ephesus. We see that the gospel is intellectually defensible, spiritually powerful, and eternally hopeful. Here's what I mean. First and foremost, we see that it's intellectually defensible. It is actually at the center of intellectual, religious, and philosophical debate that the gospel shines most brightly. Why? Because it dares to proclaim that truth not only exists, but that it can actually be found. It, it dares to say that the questions that you are wrestling with actually do have answers and they're found in Jesus that we have good intellectual, philosophical, and historical reasons for believing in the truth that we proclaim. In fact, one of the things that has continued to delight and surprise me is how some of the world's greatest thinkers, seeking out some of the deepest answers to life's greatest questions, ultimately find themselves arriving at a place of faith. I think of intellectual titans like G.K. Chesterton, C.S. Lewis and Francis Collins, people who taught in places like Harvard and Oxford, people who've led scientific inquiry of the highest caliber, ultimately found themselves putting their faith in Jesus. Why? Because there are intellectually defensible reasons for believing in him. But we also see that the gospel is spiritually powerful. It, we see it actually in a very surprising part of this text. It says that as Paul did his ministry, God did extraordinary miracles through him. So that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to those who were ill and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. Now some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. <laughs> 
Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Now, that might seem like a strange portion of this passage, especially in our modern world. This talk of exorcisms and spiritual powers and the demonic seems like something reserved for Hollywood. And yet one of the things that I think is worth noting most about this passage is what we see is that there's spiritual power that comes through the gospel, a power for which there is no other substitute. See, what we see here is that the message that we proclaim isn't simply a program that you can just implement. It's not just a set of rituals to suddenly make your life better. After all, we see these seven sons of Sceva thinking that if they can just proclaim a formula, that will give them spiritual insight and spiritual power. But what we see is no, when it comes to the gospel, we're not just offering you some sort of religious program to instantaneously lead you to your better life. We're inviting you into a relationship with the God of the universe. See, I think that's ultimately what we need. Our, our bookstores are filled with shelves upon shelves of self-help manuals, get-rich-quick schemes, spiritual secrets that ultimately are going to satisfy the deepest longings of your heart. But the reason that we continue to buy and consume these books is because while they might promise great things, they ultimately fail to deliver. But here, with the good news of Jesus, we find something different a relationship with a God who's living and active in our world, a relationship with a God who enters in in order to bring healing and wholeness and, and new life, a, a God who desires to bring freedom from spiritual darkness and who invites us to walk in the light. There is no other substitute. We see that the gospel is spiritually powerful because it actually connects us with the one who holds the very galaxies in the palm of his hand, and yet knows each one of us intimately. Final thing that we see about the gospel is that it is eternally hopeful. I mean, look at the response to Paul's ministry that we find in Ephesus. We find people increasingly flocking to him to hear the news being preached. We find people bringing their ailments and their hurts to Paul to be healed. We find people abandoning their, their other systems and their other faiths in favor of following this one known as Jesus. Over and over again, people are coming to him. Why? Because what he's proclaiming is something so much greater than anything that they'd ever heard or seen or received. Because the message of the gospel was connecting them to something so much greater than themselves. The story of God written on the pages of history, pointing to the promises of eternity. I love how Richard North, the environmental correspondent for The Independent, put it. He said, an awful lot of us just need to worship something. But in order to be able to worship, you have to be able to find something outside of yourself and better than yourself. You see, what Paul was showing the people of Ephesus is that the story of Jesus Christ is the only one large enough to satisfy our greatest hopes. The only one powerful enough to calm our deepest fears and the only one true enough to answer our, our biggest questions. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves as God's people is, where has he sent us? Where has he sent you? Rather than holding the world at arm's length, we are called to be people who reach the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. To love the world without falling for it. To actually have eyes to see and ears to hear the spiritual longings of the people around us. So that's the question I really want us to wrestle with is where has God sent us? Where has he sent you? You want to see your culture changed? Well, then start right where you are. You want to see your community transformed? Then begin with your neighbors if you long for transformation in the economy and justice for the oppressed, then start serving the needy in your neighborhood and, and work with equity in your workplace. See, in all of these places, God is at work. He's, he's doing something to reach this spiritually hungry and thirsty around us. 
He's, he's calling us to join him in the mission that he has to reach all nations so that everyone might learn to look, live, and love more like Jesus. You see, as we come to the end of this series, it's a beautiful reminder that we have a surprising message that God's salvation is offered as a free gift of grace to everybody. We learn that he uses surprising messengers, you and me, in the everyday comings and goings of our lives, in the hustle and bustle of the busy. He uses us in our stories to speak of his story to those around us. He calls us into a surprising church, this family of God, where people from so many different backgrounds are held together in unity by the love that we've received through Jesus. And it's all that we together might live out this surprising mission, one which not only can take root in, but flourish at the very cultural centers of our world in ways that touch the lives of millions. But it starts with us. And so as we come to the end of this series, Surprising Faith, that's exactly what I want to pray. Would you please pray with me? Lord God, we give you so much thanks that we have a surprising faith. One that dares to proclaim this incredible message. That you, Lord Jesus, were willing to leave all the pleasures of heaven and enter into this world to rescue us. That your salvation is offered as a free gift to all who believe. And that you now surprisingly invite us into that work. So help us to be your messengers, your family, living out your mission. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear the spiritual longings, hunger, and curiosity of the people around us. Help us to not stand at arm's distance in judgment, but rather to enter in with compassion as well as with courage so that we can point them to where hope is truly found, only in you, Lord Jesus. And our prayer is that as we do that, more and more people would learn to look, live, and love just like you. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen.